friend from below. The Starwood defenders are en route to Maglubishima, the hobgoblin capital, to steal the Iron Shadow's answer to the first of Giles Karnas' riddles and supplant Daimyo Kanji with Taichu Hiragana. The former mayor of Port Sovereign was unimaginably rich, and even an empire as mighty as that ruled by Kanji would be vastly strengthened by the Kartner's fortune. As the Trove Islands have been invaded by the Hoblins, and communities to the north of the fallen southward head are still under threat, the Hobgoblins represent a foe as dangerous, if not more so, than the drow encroaching from the north. The party has just arrived at Monolith Haven, the home of Tor. This is an obvious port of call, as it is reached with hardly a detour, and the party are keen to find out if Seamus roots him off. Tor's father and the clan chief can spare help for the Trove Islands in the fight against their immediate foes. I was never really much one for fighting, and out of fear of losing my father's respect, this is why I fled to the coast to escape that life. But the Trove Islands are in big trouble if I don't speak up, so I have no choice but to face up to the old man. Not only that, but prior to the party's arrival, Tor's raven returned, bearing a bizarre message of its own. Apparently it was written by his sister, Tulsa, although the badly written, childlike handwriting style is barely recognisable. Rather than reassuring promises of reinforcements, the message contains scarcely legible talk of a friend from below that apparently Tulsa is desperate for Tor and his friends to meet. The muddled and irrelevant style of Tulsa's letter might explain why the mighty Goliaths themselves had not crushed the goblin slavers, the demon they had summoned, and its two clawed succubi. Might the Starwalk defenders have prevented the enslavement of Tor's clan by dispatching the enemy at Monolith Haven's entryway? Hoping for a hero's welcome in the form of the traditional victor's dish Pelk's Quirky, Tor finds his kinsman Foggy, disorientated and certainly in no shape to make even the most basic meal, and mumbling about the friend from below in Tulsa's letter. Only Wolfer, the would-be merchant, seems unaffected by… whatever it is. The Goliath is keen to build a stockpile of basic weapons so that the clan can defend itself, although Wolfer's answers regarding whether this defence is from the friend from below are vague and evasive. Tor knows him to be an uncharacteristically battle-shy soul, given the Goliath race's general reputation for loving a good fight. Although he and Tor share this trait to some extent, without the Rusimov name at his back, Wolfer has always enjoyed a lowly status in Monolith Haven. Nevertheless, Perhaps his fearfulness has kept him out of reach of whatever has brought his other kinsmen so low. Raffan gives Wolfer a warhammer, bought from Sibyl the Construct, and a shield. Tor donates a hobgoblin sword and Rudu a mace, a small but welcome contribution. To Tor's dismay, he finds his father, the King Chief, in his audience chamber, in a similar state. Although unable to get a satisfactory answer about what is going on from his father, Tor starts to piece together that whatever is influencing Seamus is emanating from the temple complex in the long-forgotten ruins below and behind where Monolith Haven was established. Wolfer helps Tor gather some sacred Goliath artefacts to which only the ruling family are technically permitted access. The immovable rod of the Goliaths and the scepter of the Goliaths are no mere ceremonial tokens and may help the party face the threat in the mountain's abandoned interior. As a child, Tor was told never to venture into the caverns behind Monolith Haven because enclosed spaces are unhealthy and unfit for Goliaths. Such mighty folk should hunt and fight on wide open plains, such as those travelled by the party on its way here. However, Tor's childhood peers passed on snippets of other stories they had overheard, some about how the abandoned temple complex had been overrun by all kinds of dark dwelling monsters. Others yet told that the temple was never abandoned, and celebrations of ancient dead gods still take place to this day. There is clearly no time to waste, and the stalwart defenders pass through the forbidden doorway at the back of Monolith Haven. It is not long before the first signs that something is very wrong begin to manifest. With each further step, ever more dense clusters of blind, purple tentacles weave restlessly to either side of the party. This is only the first bad omen, though. From the shadows emerges Kristen Leftfield, the mayoress of Port Sovereign. As if this were not unexpected enough, she offers herself to Harafen in an attempt to seduce him. 
However, this is an illusion spun by the grotesque, fish-belly white, death's head nightmare spider Krishri. It would seem that the stories Tor had always hoped were no more than childhood myths are all too horrible reality. Be that as it may, the stalwart defenders are carving a present day saga of their own, and once Krishri's mind manipulation is seen past, her and her pallid brood are defeated. The next task comes in the form of Cerberus himself, the giant three-headed hound of hell. The beast is apparently ridden by Shadow Devil and flanked by two giant-sized skeletons. However, this is no illusion. This really is Shadow Devil, and he really does still want his sword back. The spectre has returned with allies much stronger than those with which it attacked the woman scorned, but the stalwart defenders are well rested, little the worse for wear with their encounter with Krishri, and Tor is brandishing the might of his forebearers in the form of the two royal artifacts. Once again, Shadow Devil is soundly routed. Once again, he must take the news of his failure back to hell. Stalwart not just in name, the party presses grimly onwards into the oppressive gloom. Drawn on by the sound of cultists chanting, the party comes upon the temple of an undead god. Amid the chants, a Goliath prisoner is being prepared as an offering, which the dead god is satisfied. Will please the friend from below. If even deities are enthralled to this thing, then what kind of monstrosity must it be? One more red nightmare. Although Krishri, Cerberus and Shadow Devil proved surprisingly easy for the company to dispatch, in doing so they spent more of their reserves of strength and power than they might have hoped to bring with them into the mausoleum of the dead god. The giant skeletons who accompanied Shadow Devil were only two of the ancient sentinels flanking the crypt. The dead god itself can wither a creature merely by turning its gaze upon it. Up close, its very presence drains the soul of any foe. The gods' fanatical cultists tip the already overbalanced scales yet further in favour of the foes. As the party is battered back and staring overwhelming defeat in the bony, eyeless face, a sinister voice beckons to Kadira from the stalwart defender's flank. Of all creatures, she should be Sclorota the Night Hag. The party last encountered this crone when it helped Red Snapper Dwarves fight off Sclorota's coven back in Port Sovereign. The Boover Hags were also trying to solve the Cartness riddle. Whatever her reasons for being here and now, Sclorota offers Kadira a deal. You are searching for the answers to the Cartness riddle, yes? When you have found it, you will tell me. If you promise me this, I will restore the lot of you to full force. Kadira spies a flaw that may act as a get-out in Sclorota's offer, and so, playing her cards close to her chest, agrees to the deal. The heavens, or the hells, know what enchantment the Night Hag uses, but the stalwart defender's wounds are healed and their magical abilities are revived. It would seem that even minor deities such as the dead god are rivaled by the stalwart defenders at full strength. Although it takes everything the rejuvenated party has to offer, the entity and its minions are defeated. Here's to hoping the exploit Kadira intends to use to dodge her end of the bargain does not land the party in even hotter water when Sclerotta comes to settle the deal. As the dead god fades, he reverts to the form of the fallen St. Luke. What corruption this long-dead paragon must have gone through to become the dead god is buried deep in the past and will forever remain a mystery, but at least the curse has been put to rest. The dead gods' cultists, those that survived the fight, stagger around knowing all too well they have damned themselves in caving into the sins of the evil temple. Harafon plants a firm kick in the buttocks of one such wretched individual, but this indignity is small beer compared to the fate that awaits the fanatics in the next life. Ambrose, heedless of the party's need to rest after the fight, strives on into the cavern left by the dead god. There, he encounters the next stage in the purple tentacle creature's life cycle. In fact, these are not tentacles, but vermiform monsters in their own right. More specifically, they are hungry monsters, and as Ambrose recklessly wanders too close to one such beast, he is all but devoured in a single gulp. It is only thanks to Mayona's hearing the disruption from afar that the one-armed commander is saved. In the chamber beyond the wormling nursery, the party faces a beast in the final stage of the purple worm's life cycle. If the dead god was not the friend from below, then surely this is it. 
In a fight for the very lives of its members, the party defeats the creature. Taichu Hiragana also kills one of the juveniles, although as the slain monster slides into the cavity from which it burst, it drags the black sword the hobgoblin general wrested from the deck of the woman scorned with it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to follow the adventure as it continues to unfold. If you're really enjoying the Color 3 for A series, maybe you'd be interested in becoming a patron of the channel. I guarantee that every penny will be ploughed back into making future episodes even more awesomer. The main outlay for me at the moment is 3D models whose cost can rack up even on a shoestring. However, with a larger budget, I could even commission 3D artists, voice actors and who knows what. Thanks also to the great Calathy for a players, past and present for their characters' backstories and for their role in creating the world.